On November 23, 2025, midday in Ethiopia's Afar Desert turned to sudden darkness. Lightning tore through an ash-choked sky as villagers scrambled to escape falling debris. What looked like a dormant volcano just exploded, sending shockwaves across continents, disrupting flights, and leaving even scientists guessing which mountain was to blame. But what truly unleashed this once in 12,000-year eruption, and why did everyone miss the warning signs? The answer changes what we thought we knew about Africa's most dangerous rift. A wall of black ash surges skyward, blotting out the midday sun over the Afar Desert. The ground shakes as a deafening roar rolls across the salt flats. In an instant, the horizon vanishes behind a plume so dense and towering, it seems to swallow the sky itself. Lightning crackles through the darkness, branching in wild, electric webs from the heart of the eruption. The air fills with the sharp tang of sulfur and dust. Shockwaves ripple outward, rattling windows in distant villages and sending herders running for shelter. At the volcano's base, the earth splits open, spewing fountains of molten rock and clouds of ash that climb nearly 15 kilometers into the atmosphere. The eruption's force is relentless. Each blast hurls new debris higher. Each flash of volcanic lightning illuminates the chaos for a fraction of a second. Ash begins to fall, first as a fine gray mist, then in heavy sheets, blanketing the desert and coating everything in a ghostly layer. Within minutes, day turns to night. Animals scatter, caravans grind to a halt, and the only sounds are the distant rumble of explosions and the hiss of falling ash. From Afdera, a village just northwest of the volcano, the sky is a moving tapestry of darkness and fire. Residents describe the sensation as if a bomb had gone off beneath their feet, windows shaking, doors slamming, the unmistakable feeling that something ancient and powerful has awakened. Satellite images, captured in real time, show a plume stretching for hundreds of kilometers, curling east and north on the jet stream. The eruption's signature, anvil shaped with a shadow that sweeps across the land, signals to scientists and pilots alike that this is no ordinary event. Reports of volcanic lightning multiply, each flash a sign of ash and static colliding in the superheated column. For the first time in 12,000 years, this volcano is not just alive, it is rewriting the landscape, the sky, and the rules of what is possible in the world's most restless rift. The spectacle is both terrifying and mesmerizing, a reminder that beneath the surface, the Earth is never truly still. In Afdera, the world shrinks to a circle of dust and noise. Salt caravans, lifelines of the desert, stand frozen, their camels restless and blinking through a haze so thick that midday feels like midnight. Ash settles on every surface, turning the familiar landscape into something strange and hostile. Herders pull scarves over their faces and hurry their animals toward the shelter of stone walls, but the ash seeps into every crack. The air tastes of minerals and fire, Afar villagers describe the darkness as absolute. Children huddle indoors, listening to the distant rumble, while elders scan the horizon for any sign of the sun. The village mosque's call to prayer echoes through the gloom, muffled by the falling ash. For many, it is the first time in memory that the sky has vanished so completely. Salt traders, caught between distant outposts, abandon their roots and crouch beside their camels, waiting for the choking rain to ease. One caravan leader, speaking on a crackling phone, described walking blind for hours. He said the ground shook, the sky went black, and they could only hear each other's voices. They thought the world was ending. Livestock, the backbone of a far life, panic in the confusion. Goats and cattle scatter in the darkness, some lost for hours before the ash thins enough for their owners to find them. Grazing land, once a patchwork of brittle grass and salt, disappears under a layer of gray. Water troughs fill with grit. The day's routines, fetching water, tending animals, trading salt, are abandoned as survival becomes the only priority. Communication falters. Radios jam with static and cell signals drop without warning. Families separated by only a few kilometers struggle to reach each other. In the chaos, rumors spread. Some say Erta Ale has erupted. Others blame Alu Alibagu. No one is sure which volcano has awakened, only that the world they know has changed in an instant. By nightfall, the ash continues to drift, 
settling into every fold of clothing and every corner of every home. The people of Afdira wait in uneasy silence, watching the horizon for any sign of light and wondering what will come when the darkness finally lifts. Confusion swept through newsrooms and scientific agencies as the first reports reached Addis Ababa and beyond. Early bulletins pointed to Alu Alibagu, a remote, little-visited summit within the Afar Depression as the source of the eruption. International wire services, picking up on local statements and preliminary advisories, began circulating the name across headlines and emergency alerts. For a brief window, Alu Alibagu became the center of global attention, a volcano with no eruptions on record, suddenly blamed for one of the most violent paroxysms in recent memory. Government spokespeople, meteorological agencies, and even airline safety boards referenced Alu Alibagu in their warnings. Aviation advisories cited its coordinates and social media filled with maps tracing the ash plume from its supposed crater. The possibility of a first ever historic eruption at Alu Alibagu added urgency. Scientists scrambled to verify details, but the region's sparse seismic and monitoring network left critical gaps. Without real-time ground data, agencies leaned on whatever information was available, even as uncertainty grew. Journalists, working against the clock, relayed statements from unnamed local officials and meteorologists. Each update seemed to confirm the initial attribution, setting off a cascade of mistaken identity that shaped the world's response for hours. Only later, as satellite images sharpened and new data streams arrived, would the reality come into focus. But in those critical moments, the story of a dormant summit roaring back to life dominated the narrative, fueling both anxiety and speculation in communities far beyond the Afar desert. Seismologists tracking the Afar region's restless ground had been logging tremors for months, but the signals were easy to misread. From January through July, clusters of small to moderate earthquakes rippled beneath the desert, sometimes dozens in a single day. The pattern looked familiar, classic rift zone swarms, often a warning that the Earth's crust is stretching, not breaking. Most expected a tectonic event, a fault slip, maybe a moderate quake, not a volcanic blast. By early July, the seismic bulletins grew more urgent. Instruments registered a spike in both frequency and magnitude, with some quakes clustering around magnitude 3.5. The real surprise came in the form of subtle, persistent ground deformation. Sentinel-1 radar interferograms captured a slow, silent uplift west of Haley Gubby up to 12 centimeters, hinting at magma forcing its way upward. Beneath the surface, a deep magmatic intrusion was underway, injecting fresh, volatile, rich melt into older, cooler rock. This process, invisible to the naked eye, set the stage for a violent release. The data told a story of mounting pressure. Each new earthquake, each centimeter of uplift, was a clue missed in real time. Sparse seismic stations and limited GPS coverage left gaps wide enough for disaster to slip through unnoticed. Ethiopian Geological Survey bulletins warned of increased volcanic risk, but without dense networks, the specifics remained elusive. The swarms and intrusion were harbingers, but they blurred together with the background noise of a region where the ground is always in motion. Only after the eruption would the full timeline come into focus, a sequence of overlooked warnings written in the language of shifting earth and rising magma. As confusion gripped emergency bulletins and newsrooms, a different kind of investigation was already underway, one that relied not on ground reports, but on the silent sweep of satellites orbiting hundreds of kilometers overhead. At dawn on November 23rd, Sentinel-1 radar scanned the Afar region, capturing a strip map that revealed a new jagged fissure more than a kilometer long, slicing across the southern flank of Haley Gubi. The surface had changed overnight. Radar backscatter patterns showed fresh pyroclastic deposits, and a sharp new shadow marked the vent's exact location at 13.08 degrees north, 40.73 degrees east. While the world debated names, Tropomi spectrometers measured a sudden spike in sulfur dioxide, with the gas plume centroid locked squarely over Haley Gubby. The sulfur dioxide mass exceeded 200,000 tons by late afternoon, leaving no doubt about the eruption's true source. Sentinel-3 
Thermal sensors registered an intense heat signature at the same coordinates. No anomalies at Alu or Erta Ale, only at the breached summit of Haley Gubi. By midday, the Toulouse Volcanic Ash Advisory Center revised its warnings. A new vent, mapped by multiple satellites and confirmed by infrared and radar, had opened on the southeast slope of Haley Gubi. The ash column, tracked from space, reached 15 kilometers into the atmosphere, its shadows stretching across borders. With each pass, the satellites built a forensic map, fissures, tephra fields, and the unmistakable mark of a volcano that had not stirred in 12 millennia. In a region where ground truth is hard to come by, the verdict from orbit was clear and decisive. The Afar Desert sits at a crossroads where three tectonic plates, the Nubian, Somali, and Arabian, pull away from each other. Here, the Earth's crust stretches and fractures, opening deep wounds that reach down to the mantle. This is the Rift Engine, a geologic machine that powers some of the most dramatic volcanic activity on the planet. Haley Gubi, like its neighbor Erta Ale, is built above one of these rift-fed magma highways. Normally, shield volcanoes in this region are known for slow, steady lava flows, broad, gentle slopes formed by basalt that pours out quietly over centuries. But the eruption on November 23rd shattered that expectation. What made this event so explosive? Beneath the surface, a surge of fresh, volatile, rich magma rose from deep in the rift, forcing its way into older, cooler reservoirs under Haley Gubby. When hot, gas-charged magma mixes with stagnant, crystallized melt, pressure builds rapidly. If the path to the surface is blocked or constricted, the system acts like a sealed pressure cooker. Eventually, the blockage fails, and the sudden decompression launches magma skyward in a violent burst. This is the same process that drives paroxysmal eruptions at Mount Etna in Italy, short-lived but capable of producing towering ash columns, volcanic lightning, and shockwaves felt for miles. Haile Gubi and Erta Ale may share a deep magmatic conduit, their plumbing linked by the rift's restless movements. The triple junction here does not just create earthquakes, it primes volcanoes for sudden, unpredictable violence. In a landscape shaped by slow drift and sudden rupture, even a dead shield can turn explosive when the rift engine surges to life. At 45,000 feet, the ash cloud from Haley Gubi pierced the upper troposphere, well into the cruising altitude of commercial jets. Within hours of the eruption, the Toulouse Volcanic Ash Advisory Center began issuing urgent bulletins. Meteorologists tracked the plume as it drifted northeast, carried by the subtropical jet stream across the Red Sea and into the busy air corridors over Saudi Arabia and India. Airlines scrambled to respond. Flight planners rerouted planes, pushing some north toward the Mediterranean, others south along the equator, all to avoid the invisible hazard now stretching for hundreds of kilometers overhead. In cockpit briefings and control towers, the conversation turned from routine turbulence to the threat of volcanic ash. Glassy particles in the plume can melt at jet engine temperatures, then re-solidify coating turbine blades and sensors. The risk is not just loss of visibility or cabin air quality, it is sudden engine failure at altitude. Pilots received real-time advisories, with some flights detouring by hundreds of miles and others adjusting cruising levels to fly above or below the ash band. The Indian Directorate General of Civil Aviation warned all carriers to steer clear of the affected region, citing satellite forecasts that showed the plume crossing into Indian airspace by nightfall. For hours, the sky over the Horn of Africa and the Red Sea became a shifting maze. Air traffic controllers coordinated with meteorological agencies and the Toulouse 5AAC, updating routes as the plume's position changed minute by minute. Every decision relied on satellite images and atmospheric models, with little ground-based data from the eruption zone itself. The eruption's reach was global, its hazard immediate, reminding the world that even a single unexpected blast can redraw the map of safe passage in the skies. The eruption exposed more than a gap in the Earth, it revealed a blind spot in how the world monitors some of its most dangerous volcanoes. In the Afar region, the number of permanent seismic stations can be counted on one hand. GPS receivers, so crucial for detecting ground deformation, are scattered across hundreds of kilometers and are often offline for months at a time. 
Gas sensors and webcams, routine at volcanoes in Italy or Japan, are almost entirely absent here. For scientists, this is not just a technical problem, it is a lost opportunity and a lingering risk. After the Nabro eruption in Eritrea in 2011 and the Dabahu fissure event in 2005, international teams called for a modern, dense network of instruments across the rift. Proposals outlined arrays of seismometers, continuous GPS, and real-time gas monitoring, but funding stalled. Each year, the urgency faded a little further from memory. Now, Haley Gubi's eruption has brought the debate roaring back. Geoscientists from Addis Ababa University and partners abroad are drafting plans for a rapid response field campaign. Their goals are as ambitious as the volcano is remote. Detailed mapping of new fissures, systematic sampling of lava and ash, and the first comprehensive dating of Haley Gubby's ancient flows. Drone surveys, portable seismic equipment, and satellite data will work together to build a baseline for future hazard assessment. The hope is to finally answer questions that have lingered for decades. How often do these volcanoes erupt, and what signals truly warn of disaster? The eruption is already changing priorities. International agencies and local authorities are discussing new investment in monitoring, not just for Haile Gubi, but for the entire Afar volcanic chain. For the scientific community, the crisis is a call to action, to close the monitoring gap, to learn from the past, and to prepare for whatever the rift has in store next. Beneath the Afar desert, the forces that split continents still stir, often without warning, and far beyond the reach of our sensors. As global air routes and local communities remain exposed, one fact is clear. Even the quietest volcano can rewrite the map overnight. The Earth's deepest changes rarely announce themselves until they do. Share your thoughts below and stay curious for what the planet reveals next.